You asked us for more mini brushless quadcopter reviews. Well, here's the Eoshin Aurora 100. Shipping from Banggood for only £100 or $130, the Aurora 100 on paper looks to have a great specification. Let's take a closer look at it now. Be sure to comment below, give the video a thumbs up and of course hit subscribe. So here it is, the Aurora 100 from Banggood. This is how it arrived and it's nice and safely packaged. I have to give Banggood praise for that. They always package their products nicely. They might take a little bit of time to arrive if you don't choose premium shipping options, but at least they generally arrive safely. So there it is, nicely packaged, full color picture on the front of the box. I've actually got the FR Sky version, but there are a number of different receiver options that you can choose when you order this quad. Take a look inside. Um, Banggood and Iashin are getting much better at this now, rather than a bit of paper. You always get a nice glossy, colorful manual, which gives you full details. And there is the little quad. So this is a 100 class brushless quadcopter. This one is ready to go. You just simply need to bind it with your transmitter. It comes with props fitted and in the box, we have a spare set of props, which unlike the King Kong 90, uh, that's quite nice. Cause as we know, these are very brittle, these little props. We've got a battery, which is a two cell 450 milliamp, which I think apparently is gonna give us between two to three minutes of flight time, which isn't so bad. Um, it's an ATC discharge rate battery as well, which is very high and that's good. It means the battery is not gonna bloat as easily. We've got a battery strap, uh, Velcro, which is good. A tool, a little screwdriver and an Allen key. Uh, some sticky pads as well. I'm not sure I would use those for attaching the battery. Uh, we've also got elastic bands. Um, so we'll have a look at that later in terms of fitting the battery, but that's what's in the box. Let's have a closer look at the quad. So in the last review, we looked at the King Kong Q90, which was a very compact little 90 class quadcopter, but the design of it meant that everything was really squashed inside. It wasn't particularly efficiently designed. The Aurora 100 is much nicer. Everything's contained within here in a little stack. We've actually got three little PCBs in there. So the PDB, the flight controller, and the receiver, all neatly already installed inside and wired up. We've got a built-in 25 milliwatt uh, 48 channel VTX on the front, which is attached to a 600 TVL CMOS camera. Uh, there's a little lens cap on there, but yeah, that's a nice looking wide angle lens. I'm not sure of the FOV. We'll have a look at that during the flight test. Now the camera does stick out further than most of these micro quads. So if you do have a bit of a bump, that might actually get an impact. It's a shame that they didn't move the camera a little bit further back into the body here. Uh, there is a tilt angle built into that camera mount as well, which looks to be about 15 degrees, uh, which should be about right for most pilots. Bearing in mind that this isn't just really an indoor quad because it's brushless, you're probably going to be flying it outside. So that tilt is going to be appreciated because a lot of them have a fixed tilt with these micro quads. The flight controller built in here is an F3 SP Racing. Um, it also has a built-in on-screen display, which is brilliant. It uses the Betaflight firmware as well, and you can actually configure the on-screen display and the components that you see via the Betaflight configuration panel. That's really nice. USB port on the side here. And there is also a nicely accessible bind button on the top for the receiver, which makes a change rather than having to squeeze a screwdriver and short two pins, which can be a real pain. The antenna for the VTX is sat here on the front. Now that's the only element of this design, which I would say is not very good. That's going to take the brunt of the impact if you crash and land on the top of this quad. Uh, and it's also very, very short tether onto the VTX itself. So that may be the first element of this quad that you end up having to replace if you have a crash. Lovely to see as well is a micro piezo buzzer here. So finally, we have a low battery alarm already fitted to a factory quad, which is a really nice feature to see. Moving towards the back and attached to the all carbon frame here is a little LED panel as well. Not seen this on a micro quad before. It's a nice feature, perhaps it's a bit of a gimmick and I would actually be inclined, if you're not bothered about lights, to chop these bits of carbon here and remove this element entirely because I can see that being probably one of the first bits that gets broken and destroyed. Worth mentioning that the frame is entirely carbon. It looks to me like one and a half, perhaps two mil carbon. Uh, and that includes the underside as well. It's a really nice compact frame actually. 
Fitted to the end of the arms here, we have some Eosheen branded 1104 brushless motors. They are 7,500 kV. Uh, and attached to those motors are 50 mil four bladed props. Sadly, mine has arrived actually with a crack in one of the props here. So do check your quadcopter before firing it up for the first time. A crack in a prop could result in that prop flying off when you fire up those motors, especially as these are brushless. The crack to me looks to have been caused by an over tightening of the little prop nuts here. So when you do replace the props on this quad, be sure not to over tighten those. The all-in-one flight controller and brushless speed controller is really nice as well. It means that you haven't got speed controllers on the arms of this quadcopter. And also the built-in integral speed controllers are D-shot as well, which is really nice to see. In terms of battery connection, we have a two-pin JST here with nice size gauge wire. Uh, the antenna for the receiver pops out of the underside here. Now that might be a little bit vulnerable. I might be inclined to attach a tie wrap somewhere on the rear of this quad to get that antenna up into the air and out of the way of these props. So in terms of attaching the battery, it's not gonna sit on top. So the battery has to go on the underside, which is fine, and there's lots of space for that. There is a Velcro battery strap here, but I would be inclined not to use that. The reason is, if you wrap that battery strap around the center of the quad here, potentially that strap is gonna put pressure on the solder joints which run to the motors on either side of the flight controller. So instead, I would be inclined to use the two small elastic bands which come with the quadcopter. Put those both around the center and then distribute them one on one side of the center and the other on the other side so that you can then tuck the battery under the elastic bands like that. And it's nice and securely held there. There's not a lot of movement. And if you move that around, the battery's not going anywhere. And then you can just connect it up like that. In fact, you could also tuck the power cord and even the balance connector under into that elastic band as well, just to get them all out of the way. In terms of weight, they quote 65 grams. Let's have a look at how accurate or inaccurate that is. Okay, it comes to 63.1, so it's actually under the official specification. That's really nice. And if we add the battery onto that as well, we're at 94.1, which is still pretty lightweight, especially considering that this is a brushless motor equipped quadcopter. So therefore it's got lots more power than the brushed versions. So all in all, it's a nice little package. For about 100 pounds or 130 US dollars, this looks to me to be a great little quadcopter and I'm looking forward to test flying it. Let's have a very quick look now at binding it to our Tyrannus X9D and then we'll have a look in beta flight before we take it for a test flight. So we're now gonna bind it with our Tyrannus X9D Plus. This is a great transmitter and there's a link to it in the video description. So first thing we need to do is create a new model. So I'm going to go into my model memory here, create model. We're gonna use a quadcopter profile, obviously. Page through the default channel assignments and then confirm. Okay, so I'll give that model a name later. Next thing we need to do is put the little Aurora 100 into bind mode. On the top, just by the receiver, you'll see this tiny little micro switch here. So what we need to do is keep that depressed whilst we apply power to the quadcopter. Now with these JST connectors, be very careful to plug it in the right way around. It's very easy if you're not careful to force it in the wrong way. So I'm gonna partially plug that in. It's quite hard to do this by yourself. Okay, so press and hold the button, plug it in. And you'll know when the quadcopter is in bind mode because the blue light on the receiver on top there will be permanently solid. You can also see at this point, now we've got power on, that the LED display on the rear is given as a little light show. That's really cool. I like that a lot. So now it's the usual process. Once we've created our new model, we press page to go to the settings for that new model. Go to the very bottom and we're looking for bind. However, you must first ensure that you change the receiver type to a D8, because it's not a D16, which it defaults to. Set it to D8, enter there, and then get ready to press bind. Now I'm just gonna move the quadcopter into display at that point. You'll see we still have our solid blue light here. When we start binding, that light should go out or flash.
There we go. So the light has gone out, that means it's now correctly bound. Now I do have the transmitter and the quadcopter very close together at this point, sometimes that can cause binding to fail. So if that happens for you, separate the two, move them apart, put one on one side of the room and the transmitter on the other, and then try the process again and it should then successfully bind. Next it's time to look at the flight controller configuration and it's lovely that it ships with Betaflight 2. First thing to do, as usual, is calibrate the accelerometer. It wasn't really far out, but it's always worth doing anyway. On the ports tab, we can see that this really decent flight controller has three UARTs rather than the regular two, with the receiver running on the third in serial mode. Glancing through the configuration tab, DSHOT 600 is set as standard, and the flight controller has inbuilt battery voltage monitoring via the integral speed controllers. The receiver is connected to the flight controller via S-Bus and the gyro is running at an impressive 8000 kHz. Under features we can see that the onboard OSD is also enabled, really nice to see that micro quads are shipping with features normally only found on larger quads. Looking at the PIDs that are set on this quadcopter, they all look fairly low and conservative so there is potentially scope for some tuning there. Under the receiver tab we can confirm that the receiver binding was successful with our Tyrannus and all of the channels are moving as expected. As an additional step I've enabled channels 5, 6 and 7 on my Tyrannus mixer tab so that I can make use of the switches on my transmitter. Looking at the modes tab there is a slight oddity with the setup of angle mode with it set to enable when the mode switch is in its central position. Clearly this isn't very user friendly and so instead I adjust angle mode as the initial switched mode. I configure horizon mode into the second position and of course leave the third position for rate mode. In addition I then set air mode to be enabled when in horizon and rate mode only. The onboard buzzer is also configured to a switch which can be used as a lost model alarm. Now onto the fun bit, you can completely configure and customise the onboard display to enable and disable elements and statistics which you don't want to see. I don't need to see the artificial horizon nor the crosshairs and so I remove those from the display. I then enable the current draw to show me how many amps I'm pulling whilst flying as well as enabling the milliamps drawn which helps me to look after my batteries by keeping an eye on how much I've used. You can also customise the LED panel if you so wish via the LED setup tab but I'm going to leave those as they are. And finally, just to clarify the version of Betaflight that's installed, I run the version command under the CLI and confirm that it ships with 3.1.0. We're going to be flight testing the Aurora 100 in part two of this review, so click subscribe now to get notified when that video is online. In the meantime, comment below, give the video a thumbs up, and of course, click subscribe. Links to the Aurora 100 are in the video description. Thanks very much for watching.